to start off with, who am I? My name is Timothy Hawk, and I was born and I grew up in Uruguay, South America as a missionary kid. Um, here's a picture of my, of my family. That's my, my parents and my siblings. I'm circle on the right. Uh, that was taken uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, I'm just kidding. That was taken a long time ago. Um, my parents have been church planters in Uruguay for almost 30 years now, and they continue serving there faithfully. Uh, my little brother actually surprised me, who's going to Appalachian Bible College. He came up today uh, to see me. I thought that was really cool. He's in there as well. Little guy there in the front. My, uh, if you don't know where Uruguay is, Uruguay, here's a map, show you. This is South America. If you can find the big country of Brazil in Uruguay, uh, the big country of Brazil in South America, Uruguay is the country located right below Brazil. Uh, Uruguay is about the size of Ohio. Uh, it has about 3 million people in it, and half the population actually lives in the capital city of Montevideo, which is at the very southernmost tip of the country. Uh, the city of Montevideo is where, my, is where I grew up, where is, is where my parents are, are serving right now. Uh, they speak Spanish in Uruguay, and one of the best things that Uruguay is known for, and is probably, it's probably one of the things that you might hear throughout the year about Uruguay, is their soccer. Uh, Uruguay does, does really well with soccer, and they have uh, many soccer players that uh, are playing on some of the biggest uh, soccer clubs around the world. God gave me the privilege of, of growing up in Uruguay. He gave me the unique opportunity of, of getting to know the culture, getting to know the language. Um, I was able to create uh, excellent contacts and relationships in Uruguay, and I was able to see uh, firsthand what the needs were in that country. When I was around six or seven years old, I made the best decision of my life, and that decision was uh, repenting of my sins and asking God to save me from them. When, when I accepted Christ to be my Savior, to save me from my sins, I started meditating on everything that God had done for me. And while I meditated on, on everything, and there are so many things that God did for us through that process of, of salvation, the only logical conclusion that I could come to was that if God did all of that for me, the very least I could do, the very least I could do would be to give back my life for him to use in whatever way that he wanted. And ever since, ever since I was little, God gave me a burden to go back to Uruguay to serve him there. After I finished high school, I went to Appalachian Bible College. Some of you might be familiar uh, with that. Um, and I graduated last year in 2019 uh, with a master, uh, with a, a degree in missions. And after... After I graduated from Appalachian Bible College, I did a, a year-long pastoral internship at Fellowship Bible Church, which you might be fami familiar with as well under Pastor Van Marceau. And it was during my internship that, that God really started opening the doors for me to go back to Uruguay. And so for the past couple months, uh, I, that's what I have been working on. I have been uh, working on going through these doors that God has opened to return to Uruguay as a missionary. An important question that needs to be answered, though, is why? Uh, why? Why am I going back to Uruguay? Do I have? <laughs> do I have a knowledge about the culture? Do I? Do I know the language? Yes, but is is that why I'm going back? Absolutely not. God can use anybody, anywhere, to accomplish great things for him. 
The Bible is, is full of examples of how God used the least likely people to do his work. So that, that's not why I'm going back. Okay, so does, does Uruguay have spiritual needs? Is that why I'm going back? Well, that's not necessarily the reason I'm going back. Every country has a spiritual need because of sin. Uruguay, it has intense spiritual needs. They have the highest suicide rate in South America. They have the, the most secularized society in South America. They have the highest percentage of atheists and agnostics in South America as well. But again, every country has a spiritual need because of sin. So it doesn't matter where you go, there's always going to be a need because sin is always present. So that's not necessarily the reason I'm going back. So why am I going back to Uruguay? Well, what it comes down to is obedience. God has given me a burden to go back. And he has opened up the doors for me to go back. And so it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what I know. It doesn't matter what the country is like. If God wants me there, I have to go. So God has, God has burned me to go back to your way. He's opened up the doors. Uh, so who is, who is sending me? Who's sending me back to Uruguay? Well, Fellowship Bible Church has uh, lovingly agreed to be my sending church. And I have also partnered uh, with the Mission Board, uh, Biblical Ministries Worldwide. And uh, they will be helping me uh, throughout this process and, and keeping me accountable as well. When I get to Uruguay, after I've gone through these doors that God has opened, how am I going to be serving him there? What am I actually going to be doing when, when I get back to Uruguay? In 2014, a group of pastors and leaders in Uruguay started a Bible college called FEBU, um, which stands for Facultad de Estudios Bíblicos del Uruguay. Uh, roughly, this translation would be the Uruguayan College of Biblical Studies. I have been in contact with them, and they have accepted me to come back and work with them in Uruguay. These pastors and leaders have, have noticed a big need that there is in South America for biblical training. Uh, people in, in South America don't have um, uh, the ability to attend Bible college like we do here in the United States. This is a, a wonderful privilege that, that we have here. Um, and it, it's not that easy for people in South America. And there's a, a huge lack of biblical training. And these pastors and leaders that started Febu have realized that. And they are praying that, that God can do that through them as they train their students with the Bible. That they can raise up um, young people to take over these ministries that have been started in South America years ago. There, I will be helping them in a variety of different ways. One of the things that I will be helping them with is I'm going to be helping getting their classes online. A lot of people don't have the, the financial means of, of moving to Uruguay to be able to go to Febu, and so what they want to do is they want to be able to make these classes available for many other countries in South America. Um, for these people that, that aren't able to move, they want them to be able to get this biblical training as well. And so one of the areas I'm gonna be helping them with when I go back is in this tech support role. I'm gonna be helping them getting their classes online. I will also be helping with, um, with different uh, discipling um, of these students. And I'm hoping that I can teach there someday in the future as well. I'll be working on um, on my master's uh, with that uh, with that as my goal. So the final question is how can you help? Because 
I can't do any of this without, I can't do any of this on my own. I, I, I have to have help. And the first thing that, that anyone can do is pray. God has given us a unique opportunity of being able to support each other, even though we may be separated by continents and countries and, and thousands of miles. God has given us uh, the unique opportunity to be able to support each other through prayer. And I really need your prayers as I seek to pursue God in this way. Um, secondly, um, in order to dedicate all of my time to this, uh, to this ministry, to this Bible college, I am needing to raise uh, monthly financial support. And that could be an area that, that you might want to help out in as well. In the back, um, I have a table with, um, with a few things. I, I have a sign-up sheet if you want to receive monthly email uh, updates. I, get, I, I send a, a short prayer update every month if you want to sign up for that. I have prayer cards. I have um, a brochure that gives a little bit more of my information. Um, and also, if you, if you have any questions at all, find me later. I'd be happy to talk with you more about this ministry. For the rest of the time this morning, I would like to, um, I would like to open God's Word and um, look at a couple, a couple verses. So if you would, turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. And as you're turning there, I want to ask you a question. In your everyday life, when you encounter different relationships, whether it be, whether it be your relationship with God, whether it be your relationship with your family, whether it be your, your relationship with uh, you know, strangers, your relationship with the body of Christ, how would you how would you define your love? How would you define your love in each one of those relationships? So let me ask that again. In your everyday life, when you encounter different relationships, whether it be God, whether it be your relationship with your family, with, with your, your relationship with with strangers, your relationship with the body of Christ, how would you define your love in each one of those relationships? What I want to talk to you today about is that there's a certain way that God tells us our love needs to be defined. There's a certain way that our love needs to be defined so look at Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to look at verses 1 and 2. And this is what they say. It says, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Before we look at these verses further, let's just take a moment and let's pray that God can uh, help teach us through his word this morning. Heavenly Father, we, uh, we humbly come before you, and we pray that you would um, open our hearts and our minds, help us to understand your word. But most importantly, Lord, I pray that you would uh, change us through it, um, help us to become more like you. Lord, we lift this day up into your hands. We pray these things in your name. Amen. So from, from these two verses, we can see that there is a certain way that God wants our love to be defined. I mean, it, it's pretty clear. If you see in, in verse 2, it says, we need to be imitators of God. And then it says, and walk in love as Christ loved us. So basically, we need to be loving in the exact same way 
that Christ loved us. So to be able to do this, guess what? We have to look at how Christ loved us to be able to apply that to ourselves. And that's what I want to do. I want to look at three different ways that our love as Christians needs to be defined by looking at how Christ loved us. Okay, I want to, I want to observe three different ways that our love as Christians need to be defined, needs to be defined by looking at how Christ loved us. The first definition is our love needs to be a choice. Again, we're going to look at, at how Christ loved us so that we can apply this to ourselves. So how did Christ love us? Well, Christ chose to love us. It was a choice. He didn't have to love us. When, when man sinned in the very beginning and turned his back on God, Christ didn't have to love us. He, he could have started over in an instant with a few words of his mouth. He could have, he could have started all over. I remember uh, when I was when I was younger, I used to I used to play with clay, and I used to like make these make these little things for uh, for my mom. And I, you know, when I was like halfway through something, and it wasn't going how I wanted, and it didn't look bad, and 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 it didn't look very good, um, and I wasn't very happy with it. I had all the power in the world to just, uh, you know, crush that clay and, you know, start completely over until I got it exactly how I wanted it. And, you know, God, he formed us with a few words of his mouth. It's, he says that he holds the entire universe in his hands. We are under his complete control. He is in control over everything. He is all-powerful. And when we turned our backs on God in the beginning, he could, have, he could have started completely over. And yet, what did he do? He made that choice. He chose to love us. So how do we, how do we apply that to ourselves? Well, our love as well needs to be a choice. In our relationship with God, guess what? There are so many times that th there are days that I don't, I don't feel like reading the Bible. I don't feel like doing right. There are days that the, the world is, is so attractive to me. There are days when I don't feel like taking the time to pray with my relationship with other people, there are, we're, we're surrounded by unlovable people that we don't feel like loving at all. But guess what? That's where the choice comes in. We have to make that choice, whether we feel like it or not, to love God every day. We have to make that choice to be in God's word, to be communicating with him. We have to make that choice every day with our relationship with other people. For these unlovable people in our lives, we have to make that choice to love them. No matter what, our love must be a choice. Christ chose to love us, therefore we have to make that choice as well every day. So definition... Number one, our love must be a choice. Second definition, our Christ, uh, our love must be sacrificial. So again, let's look at what, let's look at what God, let's look how Christ loved us. 
Um, look in verse 2. It says, And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. Christ's love for us was sacrificial. Christ sacrificed everything for us. He didn't, he didn't just sacrifice, you know, something that was, that was extremely, you know, special to him. You know, he sacrificed the ultimate thing that he could give, and that was his life. He sacrificed his entire life for us so that we can have salvation. He gave himself up for us. How can we apply this to ourselves? Well, guess what? Our love must also be sacrificial. We can, we can say we love God, but we aren't willing to sacrifice you know, time every day to be with him. We, we can say that that we love God, but we, we don't want to sacrifice our energy by, by praying to him. We can, we can say we love God, but we aren't willing to sacrifice our comfort, you know, our, our little, our, our personal bubble that we live in every day for him. Go outside of, sacrifice those things for him. It's, I, I struggle with that. We can say we love God, but we aren't willing to sacrifice uh, our plans for him. Many of us, we know what we want to do, and there's very few that would actually sacrifice the plans for something that God would want them to do instead. We can say that we love God, but we don't want to sacrifice certain sins in our lives even. There are certain sins from, that, that we hold on to that we do not want to give up. As children of God, we, we, we want to hold on to those sins. We don't want to let go of them. What about with our relationship with other people? We, we might say that we love them, but would we actually... How, how much time and energy would we sacrifice for those around us? We need to be able to sacrifice anything to be able to truly represent this love that Christ had for us. Our love must be sacrificial. So the first definition, our love must be a choice. We have to make that choice every day to love those around us. We have to make that choice to love God. Second definition, our love must be sacrificial. We need to be able to sacrifice anything to be able to truly represent the love that Christ has shown us. The third definition, our love needs to be unconditional. So again, let's look at what, let's look at how Christ loved us to be able to apply this to ourselves. Christ loved us despite the spiritual state that we were in. Christ had an unconditional love for us. He put no condition on what his love for, on what, um, he put no condition on his love for us. So a condition would be like, for me to love you, you have to make your bed and brush your teeth every day. And if you don't, uh, I I'm not going to love you. That'd be, that'd be condition on his love for us. There is no condition on his love for us. He loves us. It doesn't matter what spiritual state 
we're in. It doesn't matter how we treat him. It doesn't matter how lost and sinful we are. He still loves us. It is an, an amazing, unconditional love that he has for us. Look again in verse 2. It says, And walk in love as Christ loved us. We are pitiful, sinful human beings. The Bible says that we, that we were dead in our trespasses and sin. Something that's dead is very undeserving of love. And yet Christ chose to love us in our spiritual state, unconditionally. How does that apply to us? Well, guess what? Our love, if Christ loved us unconditionally, and according to this verse, our love as well has to be unconditional. Many times, our love for God is conditional. We love God when, when he blesses us, when things are, are going fine you know, in our lives, when, when he does great things for us. But as soon as, as soon as we start suffering problems, as soon as we get, as soon as we get depressed, Many times, the first person that we turn against is God. When we blame him and we question him on, on why these things happen in our lives. And that's, that's conditional love. We're only loving God when, when it feels like He's loving us, but as, as soon as it doesn't feel like that, we turn against him. That's not conditional love. Many times our love, <laughs> I would say most of the time, our love for others is unconditional as well. They will only receive our love when they deserve it. We're only going to love them, you know, if they, if they love us back. If they, if they treat us well, you know, and uh, they're friendly to us, you know, we can, we can relate, I'll love them. But if there's, if there's somebody that, that hurts us, if there's somebody that, um, that, that we don't get along with, if there is somebody that just rubs us wrong, many times, most of the time, we do not love that person. Most of the time, our love for others is unconditional as well. We will, we will only show them love when they deserve it, when they love us. Our love needs to be defined as unconditional. The first definition was our love needs to be a choice. We need to make that choice every day, whether we feel like it or not, to love God and to love others. Second definition was our love must also be sacrificial. We need to be able to sacrifice anything in our lives to truly represent this love that Christ has loved us with. And the third definition was our love must be unconditional. We have to love God and to love others even when they don't deserve it. When they least deserve it, we need to love them unconditionally. These three things are, are very convicting, and I would say that 
with just with these three different definitions that this would give us a lifetime of change that we can do in our lives. This, this is not something that, that we can look at and, and easily change in our lives. It, it, takes, it takes a lot of time to be able to, to put these into practice. But guess what? These aren't, these aren't the only aspects of Christ's love for us. The Bible says that Christ's love for us is so immense that there is no real way of even comprehending it. And these are just three different aspects of it. So my challenge to you is I've given you three different aspects of, of Christ's love for us that we need to start showing in our, in our lives. But there is so much more to Christ's love for us. I want to challenge you to get into God's word, learn more about Christ's love, and start putting those into practice in your own lives. This is, this is something that will take a lifetime of doing. So I want to I wanna conclude with, the, with that one question that I began with. In your everyday life, when you encounter different relationships, whether it be your relationship with God, whether it be your relationship with others, you know, your friends, your, your family, your church family, strangers, unbelievers, how would you define or describe your love? I pray that that it would be defined as being a choice, as being sacrificial, and as being unconditional. Let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we, um, we come before you as very needy people um, and people that, that are constantly struggling with with a sinful nature, and we need your help. I pray, Lord, that, um, that you would help us in the area of love to start loving as Christ loved us in these immense, immensely amazing ways. I pray that you would give us the strength to be able to make these uh, changes in our lives. Help us, Lord, and forgive us for every day, Lord, that we, um, that we disobey you. We truly do love you, Lord, and we truly do seek to be like you. And we, we put ourselves into your hands, and um, I pray that you would, you would be in control and that um, you would continue to give us a strength. We pray all these things. In your name, amen.